Very simply, a compiler translates your source code, your program, into an executable that the machine can run. And I'm sure many of you who have done some programming before will have used a compiler already. But like I was saying yesterday, there's a slightly different focus with this course based upon the fact we're in HPC in terms of trying to maximize performance. So potentially, it's worth thinking about the compiler in much more detail than we would want to in another field because it can have quite an impact on our performance of our scientific codes and the certain things we can do to, um, to maximize this performance with the compiler. So we're going to discuss what a compiler is and also a related concept where the libraries come into it, the anatomy, the build-up of a compiler, and then certain optimizations that the compiler can perform. As well as trying to answer the question, based upon these optimizations, can the compiler automatically parallelize my code for me? And then lastly, we're going to briefly discuss why on earth we have three different compilers on Archer. What's the difference between them? Why don't we just have one compiler? And there's a very good answer for that. I say we're going to discuss that um, later on. So firstly then, what does compiling mean? Well, it's taking some code written in a programming language. And remember yesterday I was saying the most common languages in Archer are Fortran, C, or C++. There's a variety of reasons for that. Firstly, because being able to translate from that into an executable and then run that directly will often give us maximum performance. Secondly, because these tools have been around a long time for these programming languages, so very efficient, very effective at doing this translation. Thirdly, because the way the language is designed, actually it can often give us much more performance than other languages, things like Python or Java. And lastly, because a lot of the tools, a lot of the ecosystem is designed around these languages. So this is what we're often using, and we want to convert this into an executable, which is machine code. And it's called machine code because that's the code the machine understands. Now the compiler is doing this translation, but also at the same time doing a whole load of other things. So it's doing error checking, it's pulling in external libraries, which we'll talk about in a moment, and also doing optimization to try and make this executable, this machine code, go as fast as possible. Again, we're going to talk about this in detail slightly later on. Now, in terms of libraries, you can imagine when you're writing a code, often what we're doing, somebody else has done before. You know, writing a file, or maybe some numerical operation, or sending a message. So what we don't want to do is reinvent the wheel if somebody's already produced that wheel. And this is where libraries come in. So we have low-level libraries, we have some numerical libraries, and also some parallelism libraries as well, which we can call into by functions or procedures and reuse existing functionality. And there's a whole load of these libraries out there in computing. And what often a manufacturer like Cray will do is they'll take a library and then they'll heavily optimize it for the machine itself. So if you've got a library that's really familiar, you've used it already, numerically, maybe on your own cluster in your university or even on your desktop, even though it looks the same, actually underlying the code might be a bit different because Cray heavily optimizes for a machine like Archer because they know very well what the architecture is going to be like and how it might be used. So it's certainly worth using this rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. And something we're going to come on to slightly later in this talk is the compiler can either pull the entirety of that library in and dump it into your executable directly, that's called static linking, or it can link it dynamically where it loads it up when your executable runs. And as I say, we're going to talk about this in more detail slightly later on. So the anatomy of a compiler, how does it actually work? We start off with our source code files, like in these different practicals, and then we run them through the compiler and to eventually get our executable binary file. And there's a number of different things that's happening here. So firstly, I'm just going to talk about this compilation stage, which is up here. And what it's doing here is it's taking individual source code files, maybe Fortran files, C files, C++ files, etc., etc., and it's converting these into machine code object files, .o files. And if you look in the directories that we've been working in with the practicals, you'll see the source code, 
and then a whole load of other .o files. And that's exactly what these are. As well as doing this, it does a whole load of other things, such as checking for errors, issuing warnings if it thinks you've done something silly, and also optimization as well, which we'll come on to a little bit later on. Now, this is a great, great simplification of actually what's going on behind the scenes. Compilers and what they can do are hugely, hugely complicated, actually what's happening in terms of this compile stage. So we're just scratching the surface here, but to give you a general idea, going from your source file to this machine code object file with these transformations, with this checking happening as it's doing that. So that's great. We've got all these .o files. And now what we want to do is combine them together. Because in each of these .o files, currently, they're independent. So yes, there might be some reference to another object file. There might be some symbol pointing to another object file. But as we are up here, these symbols are not yet resolved. And that's exactly what this linking stage does. It pulls in these object files. It pulls in any libraries and links them all together. Links up any symbols, links up any dependencies to produce this final executable. So it all gets packaged in, this final thing that will run. So as I say, it's linking everything together, and at this stage, pulling in all these libraries that you might be using, might be linking against, in order to make them available to your application as well. And as I say, there's two ways of referencing, of including these external libraries that have been provided to us. We can do it statically or dynamically. And I've got an illustration of this here. So with static linking, what happens is we have the, your, your own program, but as it's building it, it also grabs these static libraries with this dot .a ending and shoves them in. So we've got this big executable here. With dynamic linking, the program, it keeps it completely separate from the libraries themselves, and it makes some references which aren't resolved when it compiles, but once it loads that program up, if it's not already got these dynamic libraries in memory, it will also load those, make all these references point to each other, and then it will run. So with dynamic linking, the libraries won't get physically included until runtime. And there's some pros and cons of both approaches. So with static linking up here, the con is these files can be pretty big because it's not just your executable, but also all these other third party supporting libraries. But what it does mean is you've got absolutely everything in one place for that executable. So if you then want to copy it, maybe to a different system, give it to a friend running on their own machine or um, elsewhere, then actually they've got everything they need rather than any external dependencies. Whereas down here, yep, the executable is smaller, but then potentially we need to worry about shipping libraries with the executable. Up here, imagine in one of these libraries there's a bug, and that bug's been fixed. Well, in order for that fix to take effect in static linking, you would have to recompile, relink this executable. Whereas down here, as long as this interface doesn't change, as long as what the application sees doesn't change, actually, if the library was recompiled, the programs will just pick it up automatically. Now, on Linux, these are called .so. On Unix, these are called .so um, file endings. On Windows, they're called DLLs. And the reason I'm telling you that is there's this term called DLL hell, because Windows is really, really bad at managing these dynamic libraries. And Linux is a bit better, but still, it's easy to tie yourself in knots sometimes if you're not careful. Especially when we've got multiple versions of these dynamic libraries, all with different interfaces between versions of the same thing. So different ways of interacting with it, maybe if it's version 1, or version 2, or version 3. So sometimes you've got to be quite careful linking against um, a specific version of a library. Now, traditionally in HPC, dynamic libraries have caused a little bit of a problem. And the reason is, as I say, with dynamic libraries, when we start the executable, if that libraries or the libraries that you need are not already in memory, then the operating system will go to the disk, grab them out, and put them into memory. That's fine on your laptop, or on a desktop, 
But imagine an archer, if we requested thousands of nodes, then suddenly we've got thousands of nodes hitting the file system, contending against the network, trying to pull these libraries out, and you can get a very busy start up to the program and a big impact on the program start time. And so for that reason, traditionally, and this still continues until today, by default, all programs on Archer are statically linked. So when you build by default, everything gets popped in statically, so executable is quite big. Now, with a modern machine like Archer, actually that impact of dynamic linking isn't so, extre so extreme as it was maybe 10 years ago, and so maybe this isn't as important. But this is a bit of a throwback, and it's possible to do dynamic linking just with an option to the compiler. And this is all documented on the Archer website, how to do this if you're interested. But that's the fundamental difference with this. So that's a general idea of the compiler, what it does, and a very high level view of how it's doing it and how it's pulling libraries in and including third party functionality. So very importantly for us in HPC, how can the compiler optimize the code? How can it potentially give me more performance? So the compiler will try and alter your code to make it run faster. And it can do this at a variety of places. So on the source code directly, that you've directly given it, all the way down to the machine code that it's generating for the specific processor, the specific version or model of that processor. You can do a whole load of stuff. Now, we call these optimizations. Maybe that's a bit of a, a false term. Maybe it's a bit of a misnomer. Because what it's not doing is it's not doing anything iteratively. So what it's not doing is doing a few modifications, have a look, having a look, seeing how that works, doing a few other things based on that, seeing how that's worked. It's nowhere near as clever as that. Instead, it's got a predetermined sequence of transformations that often work well for general codes. And if you want, it will go bang, 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 bang. There you go. So it's not necessarily optimal, but often these transformations can give you quite a bit of an improvement because they generally work well for a lot of codes out there. And there's a whole load of strategies about this. I mean, again, this is a hugely complicated area with lots and lots of active research. But just to give you a general high-level view of things that the compiler might be doing, for instance, if you have nested loops, the compiler might look at the nest of loops and say, actually, you know what, for the memory, for the way we're doing caching, the way we've nested this isn't very good. I'm either going to combine these loops or swap them over, potentially. Also, it can do things called loop unrolling. So imagine you've got a loop and you're going around 100 times. Every time you go around, it's got a jump in memory and test a condition for termination. And again, maybe that's a bit of a waste. If you know as the compiler, it's definitely going to do this 100 times, what you could do is take the loop body, duplicate it 100 times, and you've saved jumping around in memory and doing this termination test every time. And there's a whole load of other strategies that can be built on top of that. Another thing it can do, so by default, the floating point arithmetic we do in a machine, on a laptop, so in Archer, is what's called IEEE compliant, so it complies with the standards and there's also a load of error checking that's happening at the hardware level. And you might have seen this. So if you do some arithmetic and there's an error and the bits that make up a number make absolutely no sense, it will give you an M, A, N for not a number. Now we can turn this off. We can turn off that error checking. We can turn off this compliance when we're doing floating point arithmetic. And actually, this can sometimes give us quite an improvement in performance. The cost of that, though, is if there's an error for whatever reason at the hardware level, though we're not going to catch it, and equally, it's not compliant, maybe we lose accuracy or we lose reproducibility between different runs. So another strategy is actually when you make a function call in your code, it can be quite expensive because jumping to a different place in the program and then having to modify the memory to support this function is fairly expensive for the machine to do. So instead of doing this function call, what it can do is replace the call with the body of that function instead. So it's still in the same thing, no jumping around needed, no modification to memory, and it just cracks on. And lastly, and explain why this is really important in a, in a few moments, what it can also do is reorder your operations. 
so it can reorder the, um, the order that you're doing floating point arithmetic in and also combine different um, equations, so different lines of your program to, to try and optimise things like caching. Again, for performance, but it can change the order of things. So, when should we use optimization? Well, the simple answer is always. Always use it because it will give you a good performance increase, with some caveats we'll mention in a moment. But if you're trying to debug your program, if you're trying to figure out why it's gone wrong, you should really try and disable optimization. And the reason for that is if you've got some source code, there's all these transformations on it, the executable you get out, actually, if you were to look at the machine code, can be quite different to your source code view of it. If you were then to try and debug this by looking at the executable and following the executable line by line as it executes, try and figure out what's gone wrong, it can be quite confusing if it no longer matches your original source code. That's called debugging. If you've got to do that, often we disable these optimizations. And we've got a whole load of optimizations, and for simplicity, compi compilers combine them into different levels. So optimization level zero is no optimization, level three is the maximum level. And for us in HPC, performance is the most important thing, so that's what we really concentrate on. But many compilers also give us other options for um, other things, other domains as well. So what we have to be a bit careful about with optimization is if we compile our code at one level of optimization and then recompile it at a different level of optimization, the code can sometimes give us different results. And that's fundamentally because with floating point arithmetic, it matters the order in which you do the calculations. Now, it's entirely up to you with the code, running that code, maybe developing that code, if as far as you're concerned, the answer is still correct. And what I mean by that is, if you have a code, and it gives you a number, gives you some numbers out, and then you can compile it at a higher level of optimization, and it's very similar, but the numbers are slightly different, and you can say, well, yeah, obviously, different level of optimization, it's changed the orders, we know why it's done that, that's still correct, as far as I'm concerned. With other codes, however, what some people want is bit reproducibility. So from run to run, on different numbers of processes, absolutely, even down to the bit level, the results are absolutely identical. Maybe if you're simulating uh, aircraft engines or aircraft stress and people's lives depend on it, you want to make absolutely sure that the numbers coming out are 100% correct regardless. And as I say, what you need to do is figure out what this correct result is and if there's any wiggle room with this. And so this is something I've seen. So with my weather model, for instance, last year, I was compiling a bit of it at the highest level of optimization, and we found because of this reordering, with different numbers of processes, actually it was giving us slightly different results. And for the climate people, this was completely unacceptable. So what I did, exactly what I suggested at the bottom of the slide, I went from the highest level of optimization, level three, down to level two, that fixed the problem, and then by trial and error, found out exactly which optimizations were causing the issue, and then disabled them. And that's often what you'll do. You'll drop the level, see if that fixes it, and then dial in on why that issue was there. Is that something you just got to be aware of with this? Now, there's a whole load of different flags you can give to compilers in order to control what they're doing. And this is a tiny, 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 tiny subset of that. And um, the reason for putting these up is these are quite common, interesting ones. Um, and you've got the PDF online that you can have a look at and, and see these in more detail. I'm just going to highlight a few of them that might be less familiar. So the first thing, this listing feature, is if you enable that with whichever flag, the compiler will also dump out, also tell you all the stuff it's doing during compilation. And often that's quite an interesting thing, especially if you're having problems, maybe worried about reproducibility, um, but there's a lot of information you might produce. Um, vectorization, we're going to talk about in a moment. Interprocedural optimization, that's if you've got lots of small functions or lots of medium-sized functions that you're calling many, many times. Remember what I said about this can be expensive, the compiler can focus on optimising that. Floating point optimizations, turning off error checking, turning off this compliance, 
what we would suggest as default optimizations and then aggressive versions of these. And then the final line is for debugging. And the reason for including this is actually when you go from your source files to these object files, what the compiler does is actually it throws away a lot of the information it doesn't need. Things like variable names, things like line numbers, potentially function names. So if you're debugging, even if you've turned off optimization, the structure of the code is the same. You can have lost a lot of the context in terms of the variable names, in terms of the line numbers. So with this dash G option, it pops all of this in the executable. The executable becomes a lot bigger, but you've got all this information that can help you with this debugging. And what you'll find with the CFD example is the way we've set it up, you have this dash G, um, and then one of the examples, one of the um, things we're going to look at in the practical is getting rid of this, have a look at the difference in file size, potentially the difference in runtime, and then have a play with some of the optimization options with different compilers and see the impact this can make. So, based upon all of that, potentially it sounds like the compiler is doing some pretty clever stuff. And I suppose a natural question is, okay, well, can it go further? Can it parallelize my code for me? Can I give it a serial code and then out the other end pop a parallel version of it that could run on something like Archer? And the good news is the answer is no. And the reason that's good news is because it will put people like me out of a job. <laughs> it's actually really difficult for a compiler to be able to do anything like that because what this requires is a high level view of the problem and understanding of the problem and then the splitting up of the problem, thinking it through conceptually. And also, as we've seen with the practicals, Actually, doing some runs, having a play with it, having a play with the different numbers, and then dialing in on a good configuration for it. And as I say, that's just not how compilers work. There has been a lot of research done about this, and in a very limited sense, it's sort of some technologies can do this, but the performance is pretty awful. Even compared with an averagely hand parallelized code, automatically parallelizing a serial code really isn't anywhere near at the moment. However, there is something compilers can do in terms of parallelization that's hugely, hugely important on a machine like Archer and can give us a lot of performance. And that is parallelizing CPU instructions at the instruction level, the floating point arithmetic level. And Adrian very, very briefly touched on this yesterday, um, and I'll talk, it, talk about it in slightly more detail now. So, I suppose um, the traditional view of how the CPU might be executing your numerical code is on the far left. So, single instruction, single data. So, here in the black boxes, we've got operations, maybe add, subtract, multiply, divide. And in the white boxes, we've got the two floating point numbers. So, it's taking the two numbers from here, applying the operation, and then at each cycle, we're getting a single result. Now, actually, the way the hardware is set up, the way the hardware is designed, it's actually a bit cleverer than this. Because instead of this, what it is capable of doing is having a single instruction operating on multiple pairs of elements per cycle. So what we've got here instead is still the single instruction, add, subtract, divide, multiply, but multiple pairs of numbers. So here we've got two numbers, here we've got two numbers, here we've got two numbers. So in each cycle, this instruction is being applied to these multiple pairs. So in each cycle, we get three answers out here with this example, rather than one answer. And to give you an example, a bit more codey on the right, we've got four pairs of numbers we want to add together. So here we've got this um, sort of naive view, this, sim this single instruction, single data view, A plus B equals C, one cycle. A1 plus B1 equals C1, second cycle, etc., etc. Instead, with this SIMD approach, we can build up these vectors of the numbers and then in one operation, add to get four results out. So here, we've gone from doing four arithmetic operations to doing one arithmetic operations. And these floating point operations can be quite expensive. So potentially, a big, big, big saving going from four operations to one operation. Now, it is possible for you to do this by hand, so to hand vectorize, we call it, your code. But instead, 
compilers are pretty good at doing this automatically, especially in my experience, the Cray and Intel compilers. The GNU compiler is a little bit more general, they designed a bit less for our workloads, so in my experience, for numerical codes, not quite as good at doing this. But the Cray and Intel compilers, in my experience, are pretty good at doing this automatic vectorization optimization. And this can make a big, big, big impact. So much so that, for instance, with my weather model, the runtime is often about halved with the Cray compiler versus the GNU compiler. And the vast majority of the reason for this is this vectorization. The fact that the Cray compiler can do this optimization much more effectively than the GNU compiler. So that's something that's very important for us in HPC. So any questions so far? Okay, so something I've just touched on, and really the last thing to cover here, is why we have different compilers. Why do we have the Cray? Why do we have the Intel? Why do we have the GNU compiler? Why all three of them? And as I said, I've just briefly touched on that already in terms of this automatic vectorization, some are better than others. So firstly, the compilers exist for different reasons. For instance, the GNU compiler is a very general compiler for lots and lots of different areas, whereas the Cray compiler, the Intel compiler, far more specialized to the field of HPC and or the hardware itself. So you can assume that the Intel compiler the Cray compiler as well, have specific detailed knowledge about the hardware that it can take advantage of. That may be people developing the GNU compiler, which is open source. Everybody has access to that, to see the source code of that. Maybe they don't have access to that knowledge. Potentially there's a difference there. But also it gets much murkier than that. Because programming languages, they are defined by standards. So for instance, we have Fortran 77, Fortran 90. Fortran 2003, Fortran 2008, so different versions of that language in these standards. And with C, for instance, you have C90, C99, and others. And what the compiler writers do is they take the standard and they implement the standard. But unfortunately, these standards are not perfect. So there's some ambiguities in the standards and some details left unspecified. So somebody who's, somebody who's implementing that compiler might make certain assumptions which are different than somebody implementing that compiler. And maybe this doesn't matter so much for things like Fortran 90, Fortran 77, that have been around for a very, very long time, but for newer versions of languages like Fortran, there can be some significant differences. Fortran 2003, Fortran 2008. So that can cause a little bit of a headache for us in our field. Also as well, what you've got to bear in mind is actually in the big wide world, not many people use Fortran. It's very popular for us, very popular in numerical science, but we form a tiny, tiny percentage of overall computing users. So what that means is for things like the GNU compiler and even the Intel and Cray compiler, there's actually not that many people working on Fortran, these areas of these compilers. And what that can mean, for instance, is compilers do not currently maturely support Fortran 2008. And support for Fortran 2003 has only become mature in the past few years, once it's been around for about nine or ten years. So actually going from the standard, and often have some really nice things in it, to a mature compiler which you can rely on can take a very, very long time. And there's a related thing to this as well, in terms of, maybe this is a little bit unfair to the GNU compiler, but with the GNU compiler especially, I find with Fortran 2003, with newer versions of that compiler, sometimes it can introduce bugs that are related to lesser used aspects of that standard. And that's again purely because not that many people are out there using this or testing this. And so for that reason on Archer, we keep older versions of the compiler still available. So if a newer version comes out and we install it, suddenly it causes a problem with your code, maybe you're using some new version of new feature of Fortran, that's not a problem. Just use the older version of the compiler, and then we're very happy to work with you, potentially to work with the compiler writers as well, to figure that out, find a workaround, and get that sorted for you. But it's something just to bear in mind on that. These things aren't perfect, all humans, even compiler writers. Um, and also as well, the optimization that you'll get, as I briefly mentioned, from one compiler to the next to the next, can be quite different. 
So in terms of these different options you have available, it's really worth playing with them. Also with this question of correctness, because as I say, your results from different compilers will vary. So that's all I really wanted to talk about in terms of compilers. To summarize this, it's a really hugely important part of our HPC workflow because it's what produces the executable, which is what we actually want to run. And using it correctly can give us significant performance gains. But we do have to be aware of some of the pitfalls in terms of the correct side of things. There's some differences between the different compilers and part of the CFD exercise is playing with some of the options and then swapping the different compilers around as well. And it'll be really interesting with this exercise, because I've not done this yet, it'll be really interesting with this exercise to see if you get any performance difference between the Cray, Intel or GNU compilers um, and see which one can give you the fastest version of it. If you are to look in the make files, what you'll see, irrespective of the compiler that's loaded, if you're doing Fortran, it calls FTM. If you're doing C, it's little c, two little c's, cc, lowercase. If it's C++, it's two c's, uppercase. And there's two reasons for this on Archer. Firstly, so when we go from one compiler to the next to the next, we don't need to change the physical compilation command. It's exactly the same for these different compilers. But also what's encapsulated, what's encoded in this thing that's run is in addition to compiling your code, bringing in a whole load of libraries that are needed for the HPC machine. Things like MPI and some other things as well to run on the Cray. So that's why we're doing FTN rather than GFortran directly, because it wraps this and, um, and brings in a whole load of stuff that's needed without you having to worry too much.